Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Are there any questions? Uh, how are you doing on your current assignments? This is should be an easy one, right? There's not much for you to do. And hopefully MATLAB is getting easier. So <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Uh, ODE four five. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I I don't remember, uh, but I think I've tried to kind of put a title. If you go to Moodle, you will see in each week what we are talking about. So it's probably lecture uh, five six somewhere around that. Uh, lecture six, thank you. So, <clears throat> I have not explicitly talked about the use of a subplot, uh, how to put two plots on the same figure. This one will generate a lot of data, so I don't want you to. Uh, print out the data and th capture the data through a diary file because it will produce uh, time and y1, y2, y3, uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, numbers. So I want you to just plot the results and even there use a compact way of plot plotting two graphs uh, to a sheet. I will show you how the thing should look like. Yeah, week three, you will see example of lump model that result in ordinary differential equation initial value problem. Uh, show how to use using MATLAB. So if you see the title there, you'll get an idea of what topic that we have covered in that week. And the next assignment, of course, we will do boundary value problem. Perhaps what I will do is I will not give you an assignment on uh, Monday, coming Monday, because you have an exam. So we'll take a break and study for the exam and then We'll resume uh, after the exam. Okay. <clears throat> so the subplot command. I, one of the things I want you to get is the ability to kind of uh, look at examples. Use the help online help, and each help uh, on each function has an example at the end. And if you see that, I want you to be able to figure out how to uh, kind of extend your knowledge. And the subplot allows you to plot more than one graph on a page. And actually, it follows the same system of a matrix. So there is a subplot command that will take uh, uh, three parameters. The first two parameters will tell you in a matrix terminology how many plots you want on a sheet. Suppose it is uh, two by two, then you want two two graphs on the top, two graphs on the bottom, four graphs in total on one sheet. And then you can the third parameter tells you which plot should uh, you should be plotting. So ex explore that. And uh, if you have difficulty in understanding it, always I'm uh, available, welcome, and uh, I'll show you how to do that. The other thing I wanted you to do to keep the number of pages minimum is to plot. Uh, I'm asking you to integrate for two different initial conditions. Okay, so I'll show you how the graph should look like. Okay, Th this is how I would. Perfect, but you can put side by side or you can put four in a page, or whatever. But the blue and the red lines are for the same set of parameter, two initial conditions. Okay, so what you notice is that initially, because your starting point is different, the curves are different. But as you reach towards a steady state, these are the concepts that you should be able to understand also as you're doing the assignment. Because at steady state, the, all the derivatives, the time derivatives, will be equal to zero. So what you end up solving is a set of algebraic equations, which is what we are saying. Okay? So the connection between a steady state and the transient state, you should be able to see. So once it reaches a steady state, that means time derivative is zero. Okay? So things are constant. And um, here it reaches the steady state value of about uh, four point something. Okay? 
one of the questions I am asking you is what is the steady state? And by inspection, you can say that the steady state should all be zero is well, clearly one steady state. But this is another steady state. So in a certain problem, if you have several steady state, which one do you get to? It depends on how you start with the initial condition with. Okay. So the, these are subplots with the two subplots per page, one on the top, one on the bottom, and each plot will have two curves. Okay. So it's really a condensed way of presenting uh, your result. And this is how I would uh, prefer you to be uh, presenting for all the three cases. So this is one case and then there are two more graphs for the two additional cases. And there you will find that it doesn't reach a steady state. It will reach an uh, oscillatory state and then a chaotic state, something called a strange attractor. And uh, some of you have gone on to Wiki and other places to learn more about Lorentz. Uh, attractor and uh, it is a very famous problem, um, problem that arose in atmospheric model, modeling the convection in atmosphere. So that's, I'm not expecting all of you to do that, but I encourage all of you to be able to pursue this beyond what is in the class. Uh, any other questions about the assignment? So it's basically you need to use ODE 4 5. So it's reinforcing and giving you an opportunity to Pose a problem for solution by ODE 4.5. Use FSOL, FMinSearch, ODE 4.5, and then next one you will see BVP 4C, etc. Okay, and on Tuesday I'll take some of the time to review, and I want to make sure that uh, by review you don't understand what traditionally is meant in high school. Okay, it's not going to be I cover certain topics and that's the only thing that you are required to know for the exam. No. Okay. I'm going to take certain problems and show you the approach and I will tell you the structure of what the exam is going to be. In fact, I'm, as I'm thinking about it, uh, it's becoming more clear in my mind. So I'm planning to have 50% of the exam focused on MATLAB related issues, whether you are able to understand it so that you can program these very well. And 50% of it is on modeling related issues where I give you an equation, ask you to do a degree of freedom analysis or identify the unknowns and uh, uh, set up the matrix, things like that, okay? Uh, I will give problems of the, both types during the review session on Tuesday. Um, but anything that I have covered in this course is a legitimate thing for probing in an exam, okay? So that includes all the solutions that I have posted for the assignments, the pieces of code that I have used. So you may want, because this is an opportunity for you to learn, okay? So you should uh, go and look at those solutions and see what, how I have written and how is it different from yours and other new elements in there that you can uh, learn, okay? So, uh, and yesterday I did put uh, a recorded version of the tutorial number two. And uh, again, anything on that would be a legitimate question. But the questions in MATLAB are not going to be, here is a problem and write a code to make it work that you do in an assignment, okay? So it's more going to be like a quiz that you have. If I enter this, what will MATLAB produce? Because I want to make sure that you understand some of the syntax and uh, some of the uh, problems of fixing an error in a code. So I'll give you a piece of code and say, this is claimed to be doing this, does it really do that? So uh, exploring things like that, you should be able to do, okay? Um, in the last lecture, we looked at uh, uh, the, in a deeper sense, the issue of how do we solve a single nonlinear algebraic equation f of x equal to zero, uh, and that the equation can have a set of parameters. The parameters are the ones that you specify as numbers, and they come from the degree of freedom analysis. So the extra variables in an equation will all be legitimate parameters that you can change. And then we looked at a cubic equation and some degenerate cases and concepts. Again, something that I will test in an exam. In, in an exam. Uh, what, do, what do we mean by multiplicity of a solution? That is, a solution occurs with a multiplicity of two or three. What do we understand by that? What happens to that function near that root? Uh, does it have a maxima, a maxima, minima, or does it have an inflection point? Things like that. Okay? And um, uh, we also saw that uh, we do not know a priori how many solutions are possible. Okay, in the current problem, for example, in the Lorentz equation, my inspection, you can say, well, y1, y2, y3 equal to zero is a steady state. 
but I do the simulation in OD45 and I get a different steady state. Then the question that you might ask is how do I get the other steady state? Okay, that may be a question for your exam. So you should be able to come up with an answer. Suppose you want to use ODE45, you are not using FSOL, you are using ODE45 to find the steady state. Okay, so you are integrating and seeing when it reaches a constant value and that is your steady state solution. You will get all three values, y1, y2 and y3. So there are two steady states, how do you get both the steady states? Okay, and we will see how to do it today using FSOL and then you should also be able to do the same thing using ODE45 and other routines. So, um, but the question of how many such solutions are possible is very difficult to answer, theoretically even today. Um, we cannot tell how many total number of solutions are there. Some of them may, ha may have infinite number of solutions, some of them may have a finite number but an unknown number. Okay, in some cases you may not even have a steady state. Again, uh, pick case B and C in your current assignment point out that. Okay, uh, so you should be able to know these concepts of what do we mean by multiplicity and uh, we started developing uh, and, and we implemented, we looked at the MATLAB implementation of the bisection algorithm. It's a very simple, trivial approach which simply says take two values, two guesses, arbitrary guesses in the, sh uh, in the dark, evaluate the functions. So if the functions have opposite sign, you expect at least one solution in between that range. And then by simply dividing that interval, you can get to the final result. And today I'll run those uh, examples and show you uh, how, and then we will build on modifications to the bisection method. What is the regular false scheme? What is the second method? What is the Newton method? How does the idea of developing more efficient algorithms progress from that point on, building slowly? And what you will notice is, and after I do this example today, uh, in a future class I'm going to introduce ISIS. How does ISIS solve such a problem? So they really automate all this and after seeing ISIS you might, the thought might enter, why do I need to learn all this if ISIS does it for me, okay. But in order to be able to use ISIS and other simulations intelligently you should know what they do, what is the problem they are solving, how are they solving it and that's what this course is about. What are the mathematical models and how can we solve that using computers, even though a lot of this can be automated. Okay, so let me first start with an example. And then we will solve this example using bisection method. And then we will solve also some other examples that we saw in the last class using bisection method. And so we will learn how the bisection method responds to various uh, situations. <coughs> now this is a chemical engineering problem. Okay, it's called a multi-component flash. It's a very common device that you will find in refineries and gas processing plants. <coughs> what you have is a feed. Okay, let's take uh, as an example a feed that is a natural gas mixture, okay, coming from a gas field. And so it has n components, n is the total number of components. Uh, if you want to specify, uh, to keep in your mind, it could be methane, ethane, C2H6, C3H8, uh, C4H10, etc. Okay, the whole re series of hydrocarbons as a mixture in the stream that comes in. Okay, so I could have four components, five components. You can put it through a GC and detect what are the components and what are their compositions. Okay, so I'm going to specify that this stream is coming at a temperature, feed temperature of TF and a pressure of PF. Okay, the stream is coming from the gas uh, uh, pipeline at a certain temperature and pressure and at a certain composition, Zi. Zi, I equals 1 to n. So this could be 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, all of them are in equal composition. Typically in nature it doesn't occur. You'll find that methane is more uh, at concentration, then maybe ethane less, propane less, etc. Okay, but that composition analysis will come to you from a chemist who does it uh, through a GC analysis. Our task as a, chem as a chemical engineer would be to separate Okay, at a certain temperature and pressure. So this flash drum is basically a cylindrical vessel and it's going to be operated at a certain temperature and pressure, which could be different from the inlet temperature and pressure. Okay, so this is what I call the flashing process. So I can bring in, typically PF would be much higher pressure and I'm flashing it. I'm releasing the pressure into this vessel at a lower pressure. So what would you expect if I have a mixture of many components and I am lowering the pressure, what does your intuition tell you?
It will? Yeah. I heard too many things. I just want one at a time. It will boil. It will evaporate. Lighter components, okay, will evaporate, okay, because the, these mixtures each will have a different boiling point, okay. Methane will have a much a higher boiling point than ethane, propane, butane, etc. So methane wants to be in the vapor phase, and uh, propane and butane maybe want to be in the liquid phase. You control that. So as an operator, as a process engineer, you design what is the temperature and what is the pressure at which I want to operate this in such a way that I produce a certain amount of vapor or a certain amount of liquid. Okay. So you, you have two knobs at your hand, temperature and pressure. Okay. So you can control these and then what you will see is the amount of vapor that you produce and the amount of liquid that you produce will change as you change T and P. But also the composition. Yi is the composition in the vapor phase of each one of those components. Okay. All the components will go to some extent, but more of the lighter material will go to the top, more of methane will go to the top, and more of uh, uh, pentane, butane, etc. will go to the bottom. Okay. So this is a partial separation in a single stage, and this is called a flash drum. And it is multi-component because we have many components in the stream. Okay. So our task is to develop a model that relates the outlet concentrations and outlet vapor rate and liquid rate to the inlet conditions and the operating condition T and P. Okay. Once I have such a model, then you can do optimization studies. You can say, okay, today I want to produce 75% in the vapor phase, and I want to know if I produce 100% what will be the composition and what should be the temperature and pressure I should operate my flash drum at. Okay. Tomorrow you may want a different thing, but the model will allow you to be able to predict that. Is the problem clear? Okay. You will see more of this in uh, stage-wise separation course, but unfortunately I don't see that course in this university. Most universities will have an entire course devoted to separation processes because it's such an important topic. So there you will see distillation columns, absorption columns, extraction columns, etc. Uh, but we are just using material balance principles and equilibrium information. So there are two information that we will use. Conservation of mass and the streams that are leaving. For example, we are going to assume that no matter how long you wait in the flash drum, bringing these two mixtures together, there is a unique relationship between Y, the composition in the vapor phase, and X, the composition in the liquid phase. And that is given by the thermodynamics which we will model as yi equal to ki xi. This is nothing different from the uh, extraction or an absorption column that we studied earlier. The only difference is there we had only one species that was transferring from a gas to the liquid or the liquid to the gas phase. Here I have many, many species. So I would have many e equilibrium ratios. Then these equilibrium ratios ki will all be functions of temperature and pressure. They could also be functions of composition, okay? And th these are the details that Isis and Aspen take care of very elegantly. And if you have to program that in an assignment, it will take us a very long time. So we simplify that by saying that I know the temperature and pressure at which I operate, so I know the K values, okay? And if I know the K values, then I know an equation relating Yi and Xi. That's one set of equations. How many such equations do I have in that equation that I've written? This is valid for every component, okay? So I would put an index i going from 1 to n. So I have n such equations relating the composition in the vapor phase to the composition in the liquid phase. That comes from the fact that they are in equilibrium, okay? There is a unique relationship between them. Please, if I'm going fast or saying things that don't make sense, you have to put up your hand and ask, okay? How do you, how do you get the idea? How do you calculate a Ki? An excellent question. I, I, in this assignment, I'm going to give you the numbers, okay? For it, because our focus is on solving. So I'm going to give you the numbers Ki for an example I'm going to use. But in reality, how do you do that? You, there are one, one of two ways. You measure these Ki's. So you can take, if you have the feed, you take that and there is something called the PVT cell, pressure, volume, temperature cell. And so in that, you control the pressure and temperature put the charge in a batch environment, shake it up very well, and then sample the gas and the liquid phase. 
So you know the gas composition and the liquid composition. So you take the ratio and that's your k. That's the experimental way of getting the k values. Okay. And these have been done because these problems have been handled from the 1920s, 30s, etc. So there is a gas processes handbook and this will list the k values as a function of temperature and pressure in tabular form. This is how originally it started in the 20s and 30s. But of course in the 70s and 80s Aspen came and said well we could fit curves to these data. So there are empirical curves that will allow you to calculate k values as a function of temperature and pressure. Okay. Uh, but later on thermodynamics came and said well I could actually be able to predict those k values if I know that these two streams are in equilibrium. Have you done thermodynamics yet? Not yet. Okay. So we, we are in that sense a little bit disadvantaged. Um, in thermodynamics you will learn that when two phases are in equilibrium, there is something called the chemical potential that has to be the same in both the phases. And the fugacity that has to be the same in both phases. So there is an elaborate model that you can use to calculate the fugacities and impose that the fugacities must be the same. And that in fact is what uh, Aspen and Heises will do for you. Very sophisticated model. All you have to do is identify the number of components and their their identity, what species they are, and it knows its critical properties, the uh, critical temperature, pressure, etc. So using that, using thermodynamic models, you can predict what K is. So K comes from one of two sources, either experiment or from a thermodynamic model. For our purpose in this course, it will be given either as a constant, it will be a constant only when temperature and pressure are constant, or as an equation that relates K to the temperature and pressure. Okay. Very good question. Any other questions? Okay, help me build a model for this. Okay, our goal is to relate the outputs to the inputs to be able to predict the outputs. The outputs are the vapor rate, the liquid rate, vapor composition, liquid composition. We are going to assume that everything about the inlet is given. Okay, so uh, I have already laid out one set of equations and we have laid out all the symbols. Okay, so if you uh, <coughs> um, Suppose I count, I am saying that all these are given, these are the parameters, they are given. So we are not going to count them as unknowns, okay. So if you count all the outlets, how many unknowns do we have in this problem? The outlets, all the compositions and the flow rate, right, 2n plus 2, n for uh, y compositions, n for x compositions and v and l, okay. You can also include p and p as a set of unknown because you don't know what the T and P are. So you can actually say that the number of unknowns is going to be 2n plus 4. This is what you should be able to do in an exam. In the 50 percent of the exam I said is going to be about model building, doing degree of freedom analysis, listing the unknowns and things like that. Okay. So in here if you have to list the unknown I would list L, V, X, I, Y, I, T and P, okay, 2n plus 4. Now let's build the equations and see how many equations we can build. We have, we have already built n equations, okay. <clears throat> so there it is. The first set of equations is yi equals ki times xi, keeping in mind that k is a function of temperature and pressure, yeah. Right, right. So when you do the degree of freedom analysis in terms of symbols, I'm just counting all the symbols that I have as a potential unknown. Okay. What I will find is I have 2n plus 4, but I can write only 2n plus 2 equations, 2n plus 2 independent equations. That will tell me that my degree of freedom is 2. So in addition to the input condition, input flow rates, compositions, etc., I must specify P and P, or I can choose to specify L and V and then ask the question if I want 50 percent go to the vapor and 50 percent to go to the liquid, what should be my temperature and pressure, okay. So that degree of freedom is there. So essentially it is going to happen that I will have two degrees of freedom in analyzing this problem, okay. Any other questions? So the next set of equations says FZI equals VYI plus LXI. What is that equation? Where does it come from? What principle have I used in writing this equation? What is my control volume? It is basically a mass balance equation. So my control volume is this entire 
block and this is the input and it is a steady state. So these are the questions that we, you need to be able to answer in an exam. If when I write this kind of a model, what are the assumptions I'm making already? That there is no change in time. It's a steady state. Plus input equals output. Otherwise, I should have rate of, rate of accumulation equals input minus output. But when the accumulation is zero, then input is equal to output. There is no rate of generation. There is no chemical reaction. It is not a reactor. It's just a physical separation device. So the mass balance is input equals output. And the input for each component for each component is F times is at I. When I equal to 1, it's methane. I'm calculating what is the molar flow rate or the mass flow rate of methane into that control volume, into that vessel. And on the right hand side, I have B times YI. That tells me when I equal to 1 again, how much of methane is going to the top. And LXI tells me how much of methane is going to the bottom when I equal to 1. I repeat that for all the components. Okay, so there are n mass balance equations, and I'm going to treat in terms of uh, mo molar. Normally, it is done in molar concentrations because the equilibrium relationship is given in terms of mole fractions. So y i and x i are mole fractions, and l and v and f are molar flow rates. Okay, and in fact, I'm imposing that condition: sum of all x i, summation of all the mole fractions in the liquid phase must equal to one. And sum of all mole fractions in the vapor phase must be equal to 1. These are two additional conditions I must also satisfy. Okay, so I have used up equilibrium. I have used up mass balance or molar balance in this case. And I have used up the uh, summation constraint, which means the mole fractions or the mass fractions must sum to 1. Okay, so um, I, I guess I should change this to 2n plus 4 because I counted T and P in that. So I have 2n plus 2 equations in 2n plus 4 unknowns. Okay, So my degree of freedom then is 2 and those two degrees of freedom are normally expended by saying I fix T and P but it could be done other ways too. Those are the variations you should uh, probably expect to be able to handle in an exam. Okay. Now you might wonder at this stage we are talking about solving a single nonlinear equation, and here I have a set of large number of equations. Okay, what is the relation between the two? And that's what we are going to see next. But are these equations linear or nonlinear? Suppose, assume, in order to answer that question, you need to know that I have specified the degrees of freedom. So I'm specifying T and P. That means I'm specifying K. I'm specifying F. I'm specifying ZI. These are the only symbols in those equations that are given to you as a number. Okay, Zi is given, Ka is given, F is given. Are these equations linear or nonlinear? Non Where are the nonlinearities? LXI and VYI. Those are products and those are unknowns. Okay, so it is a nonlinear set of equations, and you can write these equations as such. You can write all these n plus two equations and pass it to F sol. F sol will be able to handle a system of equations. But now we're talking about solving a single nonlinear equation and a chemical engineer, I think by name Rice and Rashford, found a clever way of combining these equations into a single equation, eliminating all the intermediate variables. And it is not very difficult to do. Okay, So we're going to go through that process to eliminate all the intermediate variables and get a single equation in a single unknown, which we can then use by sec, uh, our algorithm that we have developed. Okay, that's our next task. How do we combine this and how do we eliminate all these variables? Okay, uh, I don't think I left enough space here. This is the equation I want to get to, but I'm just going to show you how we get there. Uh, I'll just open up. Uh, Uh, this is a uh, good question. Bisection method is chapter 3 and all the root finding methods we are going to see are from chapter 3. Okay, But models are all in chapter 1. Okay, So if I am talking a model, I am just taking different examples. So you have to go back to chapter 1 and you will see the description of these in chapter 1. Okay, And then there are some exercise problems at each chapter, at the end of each chapter. Okay. <coughs> So we have F Z I equals V Y I plus L X I. That is one set of equation. And then Y 
equals k i x i. That's another set of equation. And then we have summation of y i equal to 1, summation of x i equal to 1. So 2n plus 2 equations. I'm going to define a new variable as sine and it is going to be v divided by f. Why do I do that? I just want to express everything in that single variable. Fraction of phi that goes to the vapor. So if it is 0.6, that means 60% of the feed is going to the vapor. Okay? The reason I do that is that immediately gives me, for the unknown that I am solving, if I give you these equations, flow rate could be anything, V could be anything, L could be anything, right? But by expressing it as a fraction, the unknown that I am solving for has to lie between 0 and 1. Okay? We can have all the feed going to the vapor, psi is 1. We can have all the feed going to the liquid, then V is 0, that means psi is 0. So psi is going to be somewhere between 0 and 1. That's the reason why we do this normalization, scaling all the time. We saw that in the fin problem also. Keep the numbers nicely rounded between 0 and 1. Okay? So I'm defining a new variable. The physical meaning for this is it is the fraction of the phi that is in the vapor. So it is V over F. Uh, it's a fraction. You multiply by 100, you get the percentage. And then I'm going to take these two equations and write them as summation of Yi minus Xi. So that is, I'm taking these two equations. When I write it like this, what should that be equal to? Zero, right? Then I'm going to say I want to get rid of yi, okay? So I'm going to write this as summation of, I'm going to use this equation now, okay? So it's going to be ki xi minus xi equal to zero. Now this is a single equation, okay? Uh, but the summation is over all components, i equals one to n, okay? So all I've done is I've replaced yi by k times xi. The next one I do is uh, extract that ki minus 1 times xi equal to 0. Summation over all i. <coughs> now I need to get xi. Okay? The only equation I haven't used, I have eliminated yi. My purpose is to eliminate yi and xi. Eliminate xi also. Okay? So the next one I'm going to do is work on the first equation, which I haven't used yet, but divide that first equation by f. Okay? So I'm going to divide the first equation by f. That means f z i divided by f equals v divided by f y i plus l divided by f x i. Yeah? Uh, where do we get the uh, sum of k i x i minus x i equal to zero? Uh, this is coming from this to the next step. So in the first step, I'm simply taking the difference between these two, yi minus xi, and then I'm using yi is equal to k times xi, and then I'm factoring the common factor xi out, okay? So it's really not a very difficult manipulation to do, okay? And so here I am stuck. My goal now is to get rid of all the xi's. I've gotten rid of all the yi's. I want to get rid of all the xi's. So I go back to the first equation, divide everything by f, then replace this by the new variable that I have introduced. What is V over F? Psi. So it is psi times yi. Yi is k times xi. So I can actually do that as well. Okay. Yi is ki times xi. Plus, what is L over F? 1 minus psi. Because if a certain fraction goes to the vapor, 1 minus the other fraction which should go to the liquid. So it is simply... 1 minus psi times xi. Okay? So that equation will become, well, remember on the left hand side I have zi, on the right hand side I have this. Okay? So you can rearrange this as, uh, again you have kxi, so factor xi out. Okay? So zi is equal to xi times uh, I'm going to make a mistake, so correct me if I do. Psi ki plus 1 minus psi. Okay? So xi then is equal to zi divided by, I'm going to take the psi as a factor here in the denominator, ki minus 1 plus 1.
So I have obtained an equation for x i if I know what the values of psi are. Okay, so I'm trying to keep only psi as the unknown. So if I can solve for psi, then I can calculate x i from this equation because I know the feed composition and I know the k values from thermodynamics. Okay, so this equation has only psi as an unknown on the right hand side. If I have so if I can solve for that, then I can calculate x i. But I can take this x i and plug it in there. That is a single equation. Okay, that also has only k and x i. So by combining these two. I get summation k i minus 1 instead of x i I'm going to substitute this equation that you have here okay so it's going to be z i divided by sine k i minus 1 plus 1 equal to 0 and that is the so called the rice rashford equation For multi component flash, a single equation in a single unknown. In this equation, k is um, known and z i are known. Okay, these are all known, and it is a summation over all i, all the components. Summation is over all components, so there are n terms in the sum, but there is only one equation in one unknown. So the unknown is just sign. Okay, so I have formulated the problem for multi-component flash as a single equation in a single unknown. Now I can program this function and then use it with bisect, secant, all the other methods that we are going to see. Okay, any questions on that uh, development? Okay. All right, so that is the equation in the notes that we have at the stage and oops. okay but we also have this additional equation that once I calculate psi that satisfies this equation that is find psi from this equation then use the value of psi here to calculate all your compositions in the liquid phase once you have that use that value of xi here to find all the vapor composition. So you can actually find all the variables, output variables, but you just that sequence it in such a way that you're solving a single equation and then you can calculate the others explicitly because this is simply a, a, a arithmetic operation. Now your task would be, yeah, please. What did I have in the other one? Yeah, Ki minus one. Uh, good question, good observation. So I was not consistent. Does does it matter? Yeah, no. Exactly, exactly. So what I did, I took summation of yi minus xi. If I started off with saying summation of xi minus yi, I would have gotten the other sign. Okay. So here I said summation of yi minus xi. I started with xi minus yi, I would have gotten the other form of the equation. But they are equivalent. It's very good that you observe that. But they are equivalent because all you are doing is if the curve, for example, if the first curve looks like that, the second curve with a flipped sign is going to look something like this. But it will have the same root at the same point. So it really doesn't matter which one you use. You can use either one of them. Good keen observation. Okay. So, now the question is, if I give you this equation, how many of you can program it in MATLAB? You need to write a function that will take any number of guesses for psi and return as many function values. If you can do that, then you can plot that function, you can see how it looks, and you can pass it to bisect, which we have written, or to fsol, which MATLAB has already uh, for us. How does the graph look like? Let's look at that graph. I think I have a sketch of it for, I think maybe a two component, three component. This is how the graph will look like. If you take psi to be any value from minus infinity to plus infinity and plot that, you will get a series of roots, not just one root. As remember what I said earlier, if I give you a nonlinear equation, there is no way you can know beforehand how many such roots are possible. In this case, you could count. You could do, do some uh, theoretical calculations to tell, but in general, you cannot that answer will depend on each type of problem. 
But even for this problem, there are solutions that are not physically meaningful. That is why it was important for Rice and Dashwood to formulate it in such a way that I, I know when I get the solution that it is a physically meaningful solution. Why? Because what should be the range of sign? Zero to one. If I get a value for 1.5, that's a nonsensical solution. It may satisfy that equation. Okay? So here, for example, if I plot the function, I get a curve like this. So there is one value of psi which is at minus 0.75. That, that's not physically meaningful. Okay? So you throw that away. And similarly, there could be a root somewhere here that's far beyond one that is also not physically meaningful. Now, you need to provide two guesses, for example, for bisect. With this formulation, you can always say, there is one root I know between 0 and 1. If, do I know that? Let's ask that question. Do I always know that there is one root between 0 and 1? What would that depend on? That Now you have to think of a chemical engineer as a chemical engineer. So if I have the temperature so hot that all of them are in the vapor phase, I put the flash and then everything goes to the vapor phase. Right? So then it's not going to have answer between 0 and 1. Okay, So um, when you pick your temperature and pressure correctly, that means you pick your k values correctly, you might have a solution between 0 and 1. In that case also you might have solutions outside, those are not physical, they are meaningless, you throw them away. Okay, But if you can find a solution between 0 and 1 for a certain operating condition, then you should be able to see it in the plant. And you should, that's how you will operate it. Okay, at that temperature and pressure, that is the vapor fraction, and then the compositions. Okay, any other questions? Should we take a moment to write? I mean, each one of you write that code, or should we show you the code? I guess we have printed out the notes, right? <laughs> Some of you, so you may have it in the note. Maybe I should have left this as a blank. I'll do that in the future. So now our task is to write a function that implements this particular equation for multi-component flash. Okay? How does that function look? So given this code, you should be able to explain to me what each, the purpose of each line is. Okay? Let me give you a few minutes to think about, and uh, then maybe one, one at a time you can tell me what each line does. Yeah. What's the tilde um, between length k right before the equal sign? What's that? What, what is that tilde sign? Very good. Um, I did talk about it in the. How many of you got a chance to look at the tutorial yesterday? Only one or two. Unless I have a class, you guys don't <laughs> do it, right? And if I have a class, at least half of the class will come up. Um, I did talk about this uh, logical operators in there. See, MATLAB is an ocean, so we need to slowly learn many, many things. So this one is probably the only surprise for you, right? Because you haven't seen that yet, what that logical operator is. It says not equal to. Okay? So um, in MATLAB, if I say phi not equal to 7, would MATLAB understand that? What, what, what do you think it will produce for me? Why did it produce 1? Because it is true. Phi is not equal to 7, right? So the answer it says is yes, true. Okay, it's 1. Now, if I say 5 equal to 2, what would it do? 5 equal to 3. It will produce an error, right? Because on the left-hand side, it expects a variable. Okay? So the variable must always start with the alphabetical character. Otherwise, it, it cannot be make a distinction between number and a variable. So if I say a equal to 5, it's fine. But if I say 5 equal to 3, it's not a meaningful statement. But if I say phi double equal, the meaning is different. The double equal is a logical operation. Now it is asking the question, is phi equal to 3? Okay, what will be the answer? Zero. Okay. So equal to, not equal to, we can also have a whole range of operations, phi greater than or equal to 4 or 3. Okay. So the logical operation, that's what is being used there. Okay, you want to begin? These are just comments, we know that. Okay, and I'm explaining that k is a vector of any length. 
So I could use this function for 5 components or 25 components. That's the beauty in MATLAB. It uses the dimensioning automatically. You don't need to worry about it. If I pass uh, uh, through this uh, k, 25 values, it is treating that there are 25 components in the feed string. Okay. So z is similarly the feed composition, but it must be the same length as k. Okay. k and z must have the same number of entries. Otherwise, I have a poorly formulated problem. Um, k and z are defined as global in the main. That is, where, wherever I am calling from, I am declaring it as global. What am I trying to do there? They are going to be specified outside of this function. So, I want this function to work for methane, ethane, propane, butane or octane, pentane, hexane, whatever I have. Okay. And so, I don't need to come and change and input the k values. You could write a code where you say k is equal to a set of numbers and z is equal to a set of numbers. Okay. But then you need to come and change that function every time. Okay. So, how do you pass variables and this is one of the tricks that you might find useful in your current assignment because you have been asked to solve the problem for three sets of parameters. Okay. So, you can write three sets of Lorentz functions each with a fixed parameter specified in there or pass A, B, C through this global variable. Okay. So, the global variable then says uh, K and Z or whatever the definition in the global workspace is. I will just take them from there. Okay. And then I am checking if the length of k is not equal to length of z, if they are not equal to equal, then put an error. Now, error is a function. And what does that error function do? Just prints whatever is in the quotation marks and gets out of the uh, function. So, if, when an error has occurred, you don't want to continue with that. So, error terminates the operation at that stage. It gets out after printing that error message. Okay. Whereas, display would do, what would it do? It will also print that message but it will continue to the next line to continue to exit. Okay. Here I have noticed an error condition, so I want to print it out and in fact it gives a beep as well and then gets out. What does the next line do? Counts the number of values that I am sending inside. Okay. So I am trying to write a function that will take more than one guess for psi could be one guess, but it could also be two guesses or ten guesses, and then return as many functions in f. That's a more general function than just taking one value and returning one value. So when you use it with f sol, all you need is one value coming in and one value going out. But for bisect, for example, two values come in, two values go out. Okay. So I'm trying to write it as a general one. So I count how many values of psi there are, set that equal to n. And then I set up a loop for i equals 1 to n. For each value of psi, I am calculating this particular function. This is the rice rashford equation that you see. Now, does that make sense? Like study that and then if you have questions, ask me. Can, can everybody read that? Okay. <coughs> yeah. Good, good question. Why do I use the element by element operation? Because I have in this expansion, what I need to do is when I write it out, suppose I have four components. Okay, So, I will have four terms like these. When I equal to 1 for methane, I will have 1 minus k1 z1 divided by k1 minus 1 times psi plus 1 plus for the next component, for the third component. Okay. So, I am cal calculating each one of these. So, the way I build that is <coughs> you have to uh, look at, uh, top, if, you do, if you don't understand that particular syntax, just break it up into section by section. So, parenthesis will tell you what to calculate. So, the element by element tells me if I have four values and I am going to calculate 1 minus k i times z i for all the four numbers. Where am I doing that? I am doing that here. Okay. Now, how does MATLAB do? It first calculates this k minus 1. k is a vector containing four numbers. 1 is a scalar. Again, this I did cover in the tutorial yesterday. Okay. So, k minus 1 will produce a vector. And the best way is to go to the workspace and say k is equal to. Uh, 
2, 1.5, 0.5, 0.2. I'm just making some numbers. Okay. So if I say k minus 1, 1 is a vector, the other one is a scalar. What does it do? It automatically does an element by element subtraction. It subtracts 1 from every one of them. Okay. So that part of the code, I don't need an element by element operation in here because it automatically does. A vector and a scalar, the scalar operation is applied on all, all elements. But the resultant of that, k minus 1 is going to be what? We just saw it's a vector. Okay? And z is a vector. So now I'm saying you must take k1 minus 1 and multiply it with z1. Then take k2 minus 1, multiply it with z2. That is an element by element operation. Okay? And that's why I need, here I do need an element by element operation because on both sides I have vectors. That will give us a scalar, right? No. No, that will give you a vector. Okay, so here I have k minus 1, right? And I'm going to z, def, define a z as 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Okay, so I'm saying k minus 1 dot star z. That's going to give me, what will be the first number? 1 times 0.25. It's going to be 0.25, right? And then the second number is 0 0.5 times 0 0.25, which is 0 0.125. So it's an element by element operation. The resultant is a vector. Okay? So that entire numerator then produces a vector. Okay? This entire numerator produces a vector. Then you go and look at the denominator term. I have the same thing, ki minus 1. So ki is a vector, 1 is a scalar, so the resultant of that is going to be a vector. And that is multiplied by what? Uh, individual values of psi. Individual values of psi. So psi is going to have, even though psi may have 10 values that I'm passing, when i is equal to 1, there's going to be only one value. So that is a scalar multiplication. So I don't need a dot there. Okay? And then I don't need a dot here because it's again a vector adding to a scale. But the resultant of all this is going to be a vector. So I have a vector in the numerator, a vector in the denominator, I'm dividing. So I do need a dot divide. Please, if it is not clear, spend some time, try to understand, talk to each other, still not clear, come to me and we will work through it. But a very good way is what I showed you. Okay, just Pick elements of that and go to the MATLAB and type it and see what it does. And you will understand why the parentheses are in the right place. Question. Uh, what does the vector psi represent? Is it that may be the confusing part in here because psi is only a scalar number here. Right? In that function, psi is a scalar number. But what I want to do is I want to construct this function that will, I can pass 10 values of psi. And for each values of psi, it must calculate what the function is. Why am I setting that up? I'm setting that up so that I can plot, I can plot um, f versus uh, psi. I can generate a graph like this. I want to generate 10 points and all at one time. Otherwise, I have to put this loop outside of the function. But whatever is fine that uh, you do is fine. Here, I'm using it inside the function so that I can pass more than one value, get more than one function value. But psi for this problem is a scalar. Don't confuse that with that fact, okay? Any questions? That's right. So we're going to guess various values of psi until that function becomes zero. So for any arbitrary guess, the function is not going to be zero. It's going to give me a number, okay? So that is the function that we have implemented. So we have developed the model and we have implemented the MATLAB function for that model. Now we are going to see how to use it to solve that particular problem. Okay. Uh, I think I have a set of numbers that actually work. I guess I use probably the same number here. Okay. So in the global space, in the workspace, I have to declare global K and Z. Okay, so I'm declaring these variables as global. That means in the flash function, they will be picked up. I want to make sure that I have access to the flash function. So I type flash and it gives me the list and there the global variable is there. 
right? And then I'm going to define k as equal to what are those values? 2.5, 2, 1.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and z is equal to 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So I have a four-component system. I'm making up a system with four components, methane, ethane, propane, and butane. These are the k values at that particular temperature and pressure the column is operating. My question is, what is the fraction that is vapor, and what are the compositions? Yeah. General question. Like, yeah. If you put clear on, like, the van file, will it clear the building, like, there is? Yes, yes. Again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you put a clear, it just clears the workspace in that context. So if it is a script file, and you put clear at the end of it, it will clear the global workspace. Yeah, if you put, th this is a global, so everything goes, okay? And I need to execute these two commands. Okay, so I have defined the values for k and z, which will be picked up by Flash, okay? So how do I solve this problem? First, let me call Flash itself. Okay, and let me call this uh, f flash uh, 0 0.051. What am I trying to do? Psi goes from 0 to 1 in steps of 0.5, and so I expect as many values of f. And maybe I should do this. Psi equals 0 0.051. Okay, and then f is equal to flash Sorry. And I put a semicolon. I don't want to print it out. Okay, but maybe I should print it out. So these are the function values. Okay, now I can say plot f comma sine. What did I do? What What did I do? Does the graph make sense? I made a mistake. I didn't intend to do it. Let's see whether you catch it. Where is the root? Uh, yeah. Oh, um, I had like, what is that? Whatever you print out in the workspace, yeah. what are those values that you type? Are those psi? Well, these are the function values. So the command I entered is psi equals 0 to 0 0.5 to 1. I put a semicolon there, so I didn't print it out. So I have a vector in my workspace, which represents psi values, which goes from 0 to 1 in steps of 0.5. Then I pass that to Flash program. And Flash program, for each value of that psi, it gives me the function value. So this one is the value of the function when psi is equal to 0. This is the value of the function when psi equal to 0 0.05. This is the value of the function when psi, psi equal to 0.1, etc. The function should be equal to zero for the solution, for the correct solution. The function should be zero, but the function is changing from minus to plus, which is a good sign because if, you, if I ask you the question, this would be a good indicator for me that you understand it. Look at this table. Can you understand this? These are the function values for various psi values. The first one is for zero, the second one is for 0 0.05, the third one is for 0 0.1, etc. Where is the root likely to be? Between 0 and 0 0.05. That's where the sign changes occur. The sign of the function doesn't change after that. Okay? So you know that the root has to be somewhere between 0 and 0 0.05. And then I plotted it. That's where I made a mistake. I want to see who can catch that mistake. <laughs> I reversed it. Thank you. Okay? So I made a mistake. I should plot the independent variable on the x-axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. Okay, and then you can see that it is slightly above zero and it goes to below zero. Somewhere between zero and 0 0.1, the root is there for these values of k. So if I change the k or if I change the z, the graph will change, the root will change. Okay, so I am going to find now where the root is. Okay, how do I do that? I remember last lecture we saw bisect. Uh, which was 
enforcing the bisection algorithm that we saw in the last class. So I'm going to use this bisection algorithm together with the problem that I have defined currently for the multi-component flash to get an answer to that. How would I use that? Who can tell me what should I type here to get answer to that question? What is the root for the flash problem using the bisection method? Can you take a minute and write it out on your code? Uh, on, because I don't think it's probably in the notes yet. You can use either um, the independent variable for the boss side. Uh, right. You're right. Can you define, well, we have a boss side, you're giving two values and saying right. between these values, fine, where it's zero. Yeah. Um, you're using the independent variable, right? You're, you're using the independent variable, right. So, what would you write? If you make a mistake, then think about it so you will understand. Okay? Instead sort of just absorbing from me, try, try your own. How would I, the question is, how would I use the bisect function together with the flash function to get an answer to this question for these values of k and z? What should I type next to get the answer? Everybody wrote, wrote it down? <laughs> Next. Flash. Next. So these are the guesses for the function. So I'm going to put 0 and 1. I know it's between 0 and 1. In fact, I know it's between 0 and 0 0.1. Okay, but let me try 0 and 1. Is that separated by comma? Separate. And uh, good question. Uh, the, the, between 0 and 1, you can put a comma or you can put a space. Okay, either one would be fine. And then it says the next variable is a tolerance, the error. So I'm saying give it to me to seven decimal places. So I want the function to be less than 10 to the minus 7. Okay. And then the last one is trace. So I'm going to or put it on so that I can get the output from bisect as it continues to iterate, as it continues to try a new value of x3. So if I hit return, it prints me these. Okay. So what, are the, what is the interpretation of it? Because I have trace equal to 1, it prints out all these lines. This is the first attempt. The midpoint is 0.5 because I give 0 and 1. So x3 is 0.5. At that position, the function value is minus 0 0.309. Then, okay, it switches the x1 and x2. Okay, The next value of x3 is 0.25. This is the bisection working halfway always between the two extreme limits. And it continues to narrow down, and you see the function going down. So this is what we call a convergent series. The convergent, the, the sequence of calculations that we are using drives the function value to zero, and that drives this root to a constant value. And finally, it exits with a constant value. So if I did, if I done this one without the last parameter, it will just tell me what the answer is. To verify that this is the correct answer, what should I do? Call flash with that answer. The answer is stored in point zero four three four. Okay, I asked for ten to the minus seven, so it's roughly meeting that criteria. Okay, the function is ten to the minus eight. Okay. Um, What, some of the tests I'm going to do, I don't even know what the answer is, okay? But let's just speculate together. What do you think will happen if I put 10 and 20? No sign change, okay? So what would happen if I put uh, minus 10 and minus 20? Again, there is no sign change between them, okay? How about between minus 10 and plus 20? Very good. Did you try it already? <laughs> That's brilliant. I wouldn't have predicted that. <laughs> so there is a root between minus 10 and plus 20. We know that, right? But the guesses are so far apart that the bisection takes many, many steps, more than 100 steps. So it says exceeded maximum number of uh, iterations. Okay. So the program that we have written, the bisect program, is quite robust in handling the wide variety of specifications and giving us not always the answer, but what we need to do next. 
So someone asked me yesterday, how do I come up with a good initial guess? That's the toughest question to answer. Okay. Often you rely on the understanding of the problem. So in this case, we know that we approach the problem such that a meaningful route is between 0 and 1. Okay. Uh, but it may happen that you, there is no root. Let's change uh, k uh, to 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0 0.05. Still want to keep a four component system and changing the k values. That means how do you change k values in real life? Change the temperature or the pressure because both of them affect the k values. Okay. So if I do that and then try to find a solution. What happened now? I'm giving a guess between 0 and 1, right? So this shows that you need not always have a root. There is no guarantee that you will always have a root between 0 and 1. If the problem is well formulated, meaning if you pick the correct temperature and pressure to operate your flash, then the K values will be such that you will have a value between 0 and 1, okay? But otherwise, you won't. Now, for this K value, you have to sketch the graph and see how it looks, okay? So how can I do that? I can create psi, say, from minus 10 in steps of uh, 1 to 10. I'm scanning a broader range of values. Okay, and then I am uh, calculating F flash psi. And then I plot psi versus F. This is the beauty of MATLAB. Once you have written the code, you can explore. Okay, so what is happening? Is there any root between? Uh, it's discontinuous. It's, it's discontinuous somewhere between 1 and 2. Okay, so there is a sign change between uh, minus 2 and maybe plus 10. Okay, but there is a discontinuity in between because you have a divide by 0. The function is such that you have a divide by 0 because you have ki minus 1 in the denominator. Okay. So the denominator goes to zero. In fact, you can see already uh, in the output inf minus inf. What does that say? For that value of psi, the function is infinity because you have a divide by very close number close to zero. Okay. So that is the kind of problem you will face when you're dealing with Aspen or Heisen simulation. Okay. Your task as a process engineer is to come up with the right set of parameters so that you get a meaningful result. If you just throw some numbers at it for composition, temperature, pressure, the simulation will not converge. And you should understand, is it the physics that you have formulated incorrectly or is the initial guess that you have given incorrectly so that it doesn't converge in a finite number of iterations. We saw that when I put minus 20 and plus 10, it didn't converge in the prescribed number of uh, iterations. Any questions? Okay. Um, so we saw basically how to use bisect and uh, here is a sketch of the function. Let's look at uh, the next method. Okay. So from now on it is a series of small incremental improvements in ideas that can give us a very significant improvement in performance, okay? Meaning instead of taking 20 iterations or 100 iterations, it should do it in two or three iterations. Is there a method that will do that? So the weakness in the bisection method is the new guess that we come up with is not always a best guess because it simply says it's halfway between the two original guesses, okay? What would be a better way of doing that? And that's what the answer, th th these other methods answer, okay? So here I have one guess x1, another guess x2, and these are the two function values I can calculate. Instead of saying that x3 is exactly halfway between x1 and x2, in this sketch, what am I saying? I'm saying if I know two points on a curve, I can, this is a real curve, okay? If I know two points on the curve, I can approximate that curve by a straight line. So I don't know where all the, I, I'm not using the plot command, I'm not generating a lot of data, because a lot of these concepts must be transferred from a single equation to a system of equations. Why? Because a chemical plant has hundreds of equations, not just one equation always, okay? So 
the ideas are explored on a single problem and then transferred into a higher, a higher order system. So if I have a function like this, for example, okay, uh, this is what we had in fact. The root is close to one side. So this is f1, that is f2. This is x1, this is x2. In the bisection method, where would x3 be? x3 be in the middle. Okay, so the question is, can I do better than the bisection method? Can I find a root, a guess, the next guess for the root, that is a better estimate than x3 by bisection method? And the answer is, take these two lines and connect them by a straight line. Okay, because when you have only two points, so you can fit only a straight line through that. And then ask the question, where does that straight line intersect that x-axis? That would be a much better guess than saying it is halfway between. Okay? In general, that would be a, a better guess. Now, in this figure, for example, this doesn't look like that. Because x3 by the straight line method and x3 by the bisection method are pretty close. So if you happen to have a function and the initial guesses like this, maybe bisection won't, be, uh, this uh, regular false method won't do better than the bisection. But if you have this situation, it will certainly do better than that. Okay? And then we will see how to improve even uh, uh, further. So the basic idea now is it requires a little bit more work. What is the additional work that we need? I need to fit a straight line. I have two points. I need to fit a straight line through that and then solve that straight line for x3 by setting f3 as equal to 0. Not the real F3, the real F3 may be here, but F3 for that straight line. Where does that straight line intersect the x-axis? Do you understand the concept? I see a lot of you already tuned out. <laughs> it's probably too late. <laughs> Is it getting difficult? Am I covering too much, too fast? Okay, um, so what we need to do is fit a straight line and solve that straight line for x3, okay, asking what is the value of x3 when that f3 is equal to 0. That is a conceptual idea and you see that in the graph. And what we are going to do is implement that into an equation, translate that into an equation. So I have two points, f1, x1 and f2, x2. That is, I generated two guesses, x1 and x2. That is identical to the bisection method. I calculated f1 and f2, which is identical to that bisection method. And now I'm saying x3 is somewhere on that straight line. So what does this equation tell you? If you see that equation, what does it say? The slopes are the same. Okay, so if I take, if I take two points, x3 and x1, and x3 and x2. The slope of this line is the same as the slope of this line. Okay, So implement that idea and you get this equation. You can also look at it as uh, similarity of triangles. What does that mean? That means this distance divided by this distance is the same as this distance divided by this distance. They are both similar triangles. The ratio of those distances are the same. So x3 minus x1 is the horizontal distance f3 minus f1 is the vertical distance. Okay, So that is the ratio of that is the slope. So the slopes are the same or similar triangles gives you the ratio of the two sides. And in this equation, this equation is implementing that they are on a straight line. The three points are on a straight line. Okay, Now I'm going to say that f3 must be equal to 0. And I know x2, I know x1, I know f2, I know f1. So the only unknown in this equation is x3. I'm setting f3 equal to 0 because I'm solving for that particular point where the straight line intersects the x-axis. There the function must be 0. So when I rearrange that equation, solving for x3, I get this equation. Okay. So from the bisection method, the algorithm that you have, the code that you have, you just need to change one line and that algorithm becomes a regular Poisson method and it is likely to perform much better. Okay? So, what is that one line? Here.
here is the bisection method for 10 points. This is, this, this, this is a type of question you will have in your midterm, okay. For 10 points, what is the one line that you need to change in this function to make this into a regular process, okay. Line, number, if you know it, it's a two minute question, right? Line 22. Line 22. So line 22 is the place where I'm calculating a new guess using the two old guesses. If I get rid of that line and insert in its place the line that um, you have here, the algorithm becomes from bisection to the regular process game. Okay. I think many of you are getting restless, so that's probably a good place to stop, okay. Uh, we will continue on developing this idea further through the second method, through the Newton method, etc.